провели сегодня, чтобы обсудить проблемы архивации художественного процесса. And we came in order to discuss the process of archiving. I'm very happy to welcome our main uh, hero, hero of our archive, Georgi Kizewalter, who granted over 500 photos from his personal archive. I'm also happy to welcome here Joseph Barkstein, who is a curator and an art historian and a very important participant of art process back in the 70s and today. And he donated a collection of his video recordings that he did himself. And I'll also, I'm I'll, uh, more so happy to welcome Igor Makarevich, who also handed over his own uh, personal uh, private uh, collection of his video records, uh, which is about um, different exhibitions, Russian exhibitions abroad, and also a very interesting uh, collection of his manuscripts of Russian um, writers. Uh, здесь, к сожалению, с нами сегодня нет uh, Вадима Захарова, который много сделал для того, чтобы наш uh Vadim Zaharov with us because he did a lot uh, for our archive to grow. He handed over his uh, he was working on those videos uh, throughout 26 years, and uh, we can see some rare recordings uh, uh, in his archive that has never seen, uh, who, uh, that uh, were never seen here in Moscow. So these four collections um, that uh, made their way uh, to Garage Archive during uh, 2015 turned uh, our archive uh, collection into um, um, conceptualism archive, a family archive of Moscow School of Conceptual Art. And it's not by chance that we are using the same um, uh, metaphor in insider. Uh, for Georgi Kizewalter's uh, book that um, was published last year. It's true, Garage Archive consists uh, not only of materials about Moscow School of Conceptual Arts, so we have some materials about um, uh, action, uh, actions in the 90s, uh, uh, then about um, artists from different regions of Russia, St. Petersburg, uh, and also even Ukrainian researchers uh, come to us to write their thesis about uh, um, uh, art uh, of Ukraine because it's a friendly country. And it's true, Moscow conceptualism takes a, a big place in our collection because it's uh, one of the major uh, phenomena of Russian art uh, in the 20th century. And uh, I'd love to thank not only those people that granted this unique materials uh, uh, for our collection, but I also wanted to formulate uh, um, uh, thesis uh, to build polemics around it. Uh, everybody knows that Moscow conceptualism uh, was uh, uh, very active uh, in terms of self-archiving from the very beginning. Maybe not many people um, remember these details, but uh, Moscow Conceptual um, Art School uh, was built around underground art uh, without any support from the government, without any access to the public uh, or uh, printed editions or uh, critical papers. So they didn't have a chance to display their works 
artists to discuss their works in public. Conceptualists uh, realized back in the late 70s that uh, there was an acute need to capture every single moment of their art history, if not for the descendants, at least for themselves. And so uh, in the early 80s, uh, uh, they uh, formed Papki, uh, the, the folders, money, uh, that included uh, some documents about underground uh, art of those years, um, manuscript uh, texts, black and white uh, photos, uh, different art projects that were destined to be um, brought to life. There were some original objects. There were uh, some articles uh, by different philosophers, art historians. So all these materials uh, were collected in folders. They were four folders all in all. And um, uh, there was actually the fifth folder as well, but it was incomplete. There was one folder and um, all the other materials were in five uh, copies just because there was no interest uh, in, uh, that, in uh, that stuff. So, as the history uh, showed that uh, this uh, archive uh, had uh, quite uh, uh, specific boundaries, uh, it had a certain structure, and also there was a discursive platform uh, um, formed around it, and money was an alternative alternative name for the Moscow School of Conceptual Art. So this helped um, that group of artists feel independent, both within the uh, uh, Soviet uh, environment that was alien to them, and also after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They could still um, feel confident. Uh, because they were standing on the uh, solid platform of describing, uh, following the uh, Western rules of art, describing. So then there were lots of materials from collective actions group uh, that were added to those money folders. Then there were some uh, books uh, published by some is that self-publishing so Moscow School of Conceptual Arts completed this process of self-archiving and produced uh, themselves uh, to, uh, as a uh, completed uh, in, in their completed form uh, to our outsiders with uh, certain structures with uh, some uh, uh, fixed dates key dates for their history and positions with regards to the school itself that uh, has to be taken into account by any interpreter who is working on that. And um, the Garage Museum began to collect different uh, documentary materials related to Moscow conceptualism, and it was um, following the same way that the artists uh, um, had uh, during late 70s and 80s. So while uh, following different uh, pathways, our archive uh, um, is not the same uh, as uh, the collections uh, accumulated by the artists themselves. Of course, our view uh, and um, uh, capturing uh, what, uh, what's available without any chance uh, to uh, get some of the materials uh, that uh, uh, are located in different archives and we don't have access uh, to those materials. We are trying to identify our own view 
onto this uh, process. So, like any other archive, we uh, function not only as the uh, storage of those unique photos and videos and recordings, but we are also performing the role of interpreter, the aggressor of heritage that uh, um, we're holding in our hands. So my uh, question uh, to our um, uh, guests, uh, the representatives uh, of uh, Moscow uh, conceptualism, what do you think about uh, this um, archive uh, work implemented uh, by uh, the Garage Museum? Isn't it a kind of distortion of uh, heritage? Well, I think it's too early to make any conclusions now. Uh, we welcome uh, this interest. Uh, of course, um, different fragments uh, are Con uh, concentrated in different uh, hands, so it's very important to consolidate uh, this heritage. And I think uh, you're doing a great work. It's a great thing that you're doing. I don't have any negative feelings about it. I think it's a very relevant uh, work. Because any archiving uh, uh, is uh, uh, with it uh, as long as it is re-archived from time to time. So it's a great example um, concerning Moscow conceptualism. Probably you don't remember, but Moscow conceptualism was formulated by Boris Groys. And um, his article uh, was uh, published in 1979, and actually he called it uh, Moscow Romantic Conceptualism, but uh, Romantic uh, uh, was omitted, so uh, Moscow Conceptualism uh, uh, is uh, a cultural and art phenomenon which is now a part of history of art. And, uh, uh, it's uh, great to have this update uh, um, meaning and understanding of those things that conceptualism did. And uh, there were so many things that um, uh, were not reproduced in the archive. So um, Garage is doing uh, something that helps us to um, uh, get a new um, perspective um, on um, the um, School of Moscow conceptual art. And what do you think, Georgi? You were a very active participant of archiving. I agree with the previous speakers. I can just say that it's very important that you started uh, collecting this archive and uh, it is going to be replenished and you're going to use different sources. So you have a chance uh, uh, to get a deeper view on that movement and a broader view as well. And I hope that this archive will be accessible to wide public to make research, for example, because uh, any archive um, should be used for uh, some uh, follow-up work. In fact, uh, this aspect that uh, uh, Georgi has just mentioned it's very important. So archive should work not only as um, a repository, but also a tool for uh, studying history. So how um, can our historical science benefit from it? Perhaps through publications, through lectures, and um, using some of the materials and the public programs implemented by the museum and its partners. So this position of free use of the materials kept in the archive makes it very vulnerable 
другой институции, которая вводила I'd love to remind you of the experience of uh, uh, one of the institutions, I mean Yekaterina Foundation and Yekart Bureau that uh, held several uh, exhibitions uh, uh, with regards to um, Moscow um, conceptual art. So the curators uh, from Yekaterina Foundation and Yekart Bureau uh, were following the same uh, ways uh, that um, were taken by the authors of archive art. So we cannot really predict what kind of life our archive is going to have in terms of science and research. We cannot control any uh, every action that uh, researchers are going to take after their work uh, with our archive. So whenever we provide uh, the documents, uh, there might be some threat. Do you think this threat is there? How can the mechanisms of archiving be used uh, to make sure the information is not distorted in the future? Well, whenever we enter academic uh, space, it, it becomes natural for any um, uh, research. So there are always risks involved with any research activity. And uh, so Moscow Conceptual Art School is uh, not, uh, is not uh, an exception from that, uh, but it's very important to participate in all the events and polemics around it. I think that uh, uh, the materials uh, that are going to be studied by experts uh, is not uh, something that has a complete form. It's uh, just the material for further research. So this uh, concerns that you have that this material can be distorted or abused in some way. I think uh, it's um, just uh, a, would be a preemptive uh, comment to say it. Uh, whenever people created those materials, uh, they never thought about this. So it was a life process. So there's not one single way to perceive it. So it all depends on systemic studies. That helps to outline uh, and um, uh, pave way for the future research process. We believe that um, archiving uh, uh, the story of Moscow conceptual art by the participants of that uh, movement themselves um, is very valuable. Uh, I uh, had a, col a collection of articles, uh, and for example, I lost it at some point, and, it, and German Titov and Andrei, who uh, helped us uh, um, prove that self-archiving uh, of Moscow conceptual art was systemic and was very professional because they helped me to find my article. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the uh, library of Moscow conceptual arts created by German Titov uh, uh, from Vologda, who is an art uh, uh, patron, he published a book on uh, money collection uh, that included uh, not uh, uh, all the materials from those money folders. It means that uh, there's always some internal filter uh, of of those people that compile it, who, de who decide what's valuable, what's not, what's important, what's not. Well, uh, it just uh, 
uh, I guess Andrei Monastirsky would indicate uh, um, uh, this. He would be very strict about it. And I could add that it's true. It's very important to work with archive because uh, any archive is a living organism. For example, we compiled our archives and it was uh, a live process. But when we hand it over to an institution, we assume that in the future this archive um, will be used by researchers, so it would uh, give a great benefit to people. Of course, uh, it should have uh, a correct system of indexing. We don't know what's going to happen in five years uh, with Garage, for example, whether it continues uh, to exist or not. Well, uh, we are going to exist for at least 1,000 years. Yeah, and it's just the same as we say that we're going to live for another 1,000 years. Or maybe Sasha Obuchova is going to know something but will not uh, uh, say uh, about it to anyone. It's a funny story um, um, from uh, one of the uh, people that uh, worked at the Treaty of Gallery. Uh, and so she would start every talk with, let's imagine that the uh, guardian um, is dead, the guardian that uh, works at the museum and uh, is responsible for all the uh, archives and all the pieces of art. So, uh, you know, very often it's not very uh, easy to find something you need whenever you work with archive. And uh, for example, there was no Russian keyboard, and so I had to use my own computer. Uh, like uh, some people um, uh, used Hungarian, uh, some others used uh, German uh, or English. So uh, it's very difficult to find what you really need in that heap of materials. So it's very important to make it workable and easy to deal with. This is one of the key aspects for us. Uh, the description of archive, the uh, catalogization, uh, and that's why we created a special uh, database for that uh, uh, purpose and it will uh, be uh, in English, apart from Russian, and uh, the materials uh, that we receive uh, will have uh, some kind of topographic mark. Uh, of course, we're not going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, give measurements in meters. We'll just uh, uh, indicate uh, the files, uh, the shelves, uh, where they're kept, uh, and and we are also doing um, uh, digitization of that, so uh, it will be all online and it will be accessible for those people that are interested in contemporary art. This is one of um, our goals, but like I said, uh, many original um, uh, documents uh, uh, are away and they will never be able to become part of garage uh, archive collection, for example. They are kept uh, uh, um, abroad, uh, for example, and it's not only about distance, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, New York uh, or Bremen in Germany. So um, uh, those archives uh, uh, are kept within institutions and those institutions are reluctant uh, to provide access uh, to university researchers to work with those materials. So of course we are going to cooperate with those organizations and try uh, to extend our collection 
and uh, we hope to have uh, partner relationships with the archives uh, located in other countries. Now, getting back uh, to our um, roundtable conceptualism archived, I'd love to raise another issue which seems quite interesting to me that uh, touches upon different layers, both historical layers and uh, um, art layers. The Moscow conceptualism as uh, uh, a mechanism for creating a piece of art, uh, either a story or a structure of that piece of art. So while archiving the materials related to Moscow School of Conceptual Art, uh, we find ourselves in a situation when we receive uh, some uh, things um, uh, that are difficult to uh, define in terms of status, whether it is just a, a historical um, testimony, whether it's a piece of art uh, uh, that uh, has to be uh, part of museum collection, uh, whether the papers or a series of photos uh, 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 are uh, something for uh, to be kept at the archive, or maybe this series of uh, photos and manuscripts uh, should be displayed uh, in the uh, permanent museum exposition. So what should we do in this case? How uh, can we keep this? things. For example, the tape from uh, uh, Joseph Bakstein uh, collection, uh, uh, and it's called Andrei Manastirsky about the grandeur of uh, Ilya Iosifovich. So when you uh, look uh, at this tape, when you see these uh, um, videos, uh, you, you see that this uh, was a video performance of Andrei Monastirsky. And uh, so these uh, relations uh, become very uh, uh, complex. But it's all about the specifics of work uh, uh, with the materials uh, concerning conceptualism. So every time you have to re, uh, you have to reinterpret, reformat it, and this is an uh, endless process. So irrespective of the author's position or uh, viewer's position, it can always be a piece of uh, art, and uh, it's all uh, this process is open, and that's what makes it uh, mag magical. It's a very productive piece of advice, and it's true that it's uh, one of the qualities of uh, the school. For example, Georgi Kizewalter's uh, photos uh, that are part of his art process it's a series uh, of uh, uh, photographs uh, of rooms, uh, the rooms of Georgi's uh, 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 friends, artists, and uh, it uh, was included uh, in, 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 uh, in money uh, collection rooms, комнаты. So we keep these uh, photographs as uh, just uh, photographs of rooms and not as part of uh, um, Moscow conceptualist art. So where's this boundary between art and just serial works, whether we should uh, maintain this format? Uh, do, do you mean whether you should uh, uh, keep this series? Well, we have it anyway. It's a question of interpretation. Uh, but it's an open question. Uh, it's, this is all historical material. 
um, the interior um, of artists' rooms uh, of the mid-80s, and I'm sure that uh, um, this is uh, uh, the perspective that it's going to be considered from. But should we keep your comments uh, um, for every room? Yes, I think so, because uh, uh, those um, uh, texts um, make part of uh, the album. Whenever an art collection is uh, formed, uh, uh, we encounter the problem of copyright. For example, when we get uh, Georgi Kisevalter's uh, um, photo and the author uh, gives us uh, uh, a consent for us to keep this uh, photo, to publish it, and this was was happened uh, with Andrei Monastirsky action. When we received uh, the works uh, kept in private collections, uh, the works of friends, uh, the works of friends, friends, that's what happened with Igor Makarevich's collection that uh, uh, has um, Andrei Monastirsky's visual poetry. I uh, hope it will never happen, but what if uh, you say that uh, I don't want to see these manuscripts, those visual poets, uh, poems in your collection? I insist that you never publish that. So what do we do in this case? I don't mean legal um, uh, aspects. Uh, I mean just the position of uh, the artists themselves. Because sometimes uh, um, um, they are very friendly and sometimes uh, very strict towards each other. Well, of course, some changes uh, uh, have taken place uh, with regard to archive materials. From the traditional point of view, we are uh, dealing with. Uh, um, uh, two sides. On the one hand, it's true that uh, uh, this is archive materials that capture a historical process, a certain uh, development over time. But on the other hand, uh, just uh, due to the specificity of Moscow conceptualism, it consists of some creative writings of certain objects that can be interpreted as pieces of art. So the boundary is very difficult uh, to establish just because this process is incomplete. I agree that uh, some author uh, might uh, complain about some text uh, that uh, um, is kept in the archive um, and say that uh, this was a creative uh, piece and he can withdraw it. Uh, but it's very difficult to draw this line that would be final. It's a life process. And so it can uh, undergo different changes. Uh, I can imagine that I hand over certain things to garage, let's say some text uh, that I had in my collection that can be compared with an object uh, or a drawing. And, uh, it, for example, it, it, it could never be taken away from my personal collection by the author. So why uh, should it be taken away from the collection uh, of the institution? 
I guess uh, uh, Garage uh, has no right to publish uh, those works. Uh, they can do it only with uh, the agreement of the author. See how difficult it is uh, um, for the archive of contemporary art. And it's true. Uh, it's just because we are keeping uh, a living kind of material some hot stuff. Of course, from the legal point of view, you can take any side. Like on the one hand, you can do it. On the other hand, you can't do it. So it all depends on the ethics. But uh, the most important thing is that we capture a living process. Even though all those events took place 30 or 40 years ago, it is still breathing, so to say. It's full of life. So it takes uh, all the contributors uh, and it takes us within this center of heart be uh, of heart beating process of this uh, um, uh, humanity dimension well uh, it's a very delicate issue and the agreement uh, uh, should be um, uh, reached and you should uh, get this agreement uh, um, with regard to any kind of publication and that's what garage is doing and uh, you're doing it very professionally that's what you have to continue doing. And you have to take account of interests of all the parties. I could add something. When we were born, uh, and then we grow up and we develop and uh, we change over time. So our attitude change um, uh, and our views change. I don't know about Igor, but I can tell you about myself. Um, I used to throw away many films just because I could uh, find uh, uh, something I don't know, uh, like some film I have no idea about, uh, what kind of people are there, so I throw it away. And uh, that's, uh, that's the same way that uh, the author's attitude uh, to their uh, pieces of art change. For example, we had some collection of some is that materials. Um, for example, there's art historian Viktor Tupitsin, and once uh, I found a poem in um, uh, one of the books, and it's uh, uh, signed by uh, Viktor Tupitsin, and I wrote him a letter saying, I didn't know that uh, you were writing poems, and he, sa and he replied, I never um, wrote any poems. So he rejects his authorship ship at the moment yeah that's what that's precisely what i mean um, we are keeping something that the author um, rejected so it's a very slippery way of reformatting that the author might have uh, dreamt um, of writing and we actually also have some manuscripts with victor tupitsen's uh, writings I remember that back in the 70s when I studied uh, at some uh, uh, institute, I don't remember what it was, together with uh, Kostya Rubinstein, we were uh, um, uh, typing the novel by Solzhenitsyn uh, so uh, you should understand that the time was very different uh, and um, uh, that's uh, when uh, the archiving started with, uh, um, so, and that's why it, wa it became so effective I would dream uh, to have the original versions of all the folders, of all the money uh, materials, but it's not possible. 
sometimes. So the uh, Moscow conceptualism history did not uh, finish in the 70s. It continued in the post-Soviet time. So it's uh, um, so interesting that uh, Georgi stopped uh, uh, taking photos um, of um, those circles uh, beginning with uh, um, late 80s. And like Andrei Monastirsky used to say, uh, we all uh, die, but uh, conceptualism is not a human being. So uh, there are some video recordings by um, Igor Makarov and Joseph Bakstein. We can see some exhibitions that took place outside of uh, Moscow and Russia, the exhibitions that uh, were never seen by Russian viewers. So many exhibitions uh, were held without any catalogs or the catalog, uh, some catalogs that did not reflect uh, the uh, exhibition, those works that were on display. But what's interesting that it's really valuable material. We are trying to collect it piece by piece, but when you look at these video recordings, you find out that Moscow conceptualism blurs its boundaries and mutates as part of those displays. So do you see some boundary that uh, would close the story for you as ar archivists? For example, uh, that uh, some point uh, when you say uh, Moscow conceptualism uh, history uh, is com has been completed, so we should uh, use a different uh, system uh, to mark those uh, ma uh, materials. Well, maybe we could formulate this question in a different uh, way. Uh, Moscow conceptualism has not uh, yet uh, completed. It's just our participation in collecting and cap capturing those events finished. Because uh, in the past, we felt our responsibility uh, for this, because this, all these materials could disappear. Uh, but beginning with the 90s, uh, we don't feel this need anymore because uh, it uh, stopped being an underground movement. So hundreds of people capture uh, every move uh, an artist uh, makes. So there's no need for our participation. And uh, this was uh, something that Georgi uh, mentioned uh, in his talk here um, at Garage. So we feel um, different uh, things now. We um, did what we could, but the movement con is continued. Uh, I remember m the recording I uh, did in New York when I ca came to uh, for an exhibition that we held together with the Boston Museum. Uh, so uh, then we had uh, um, different exhibitions that uh, we uh, uh, held here in uh, Moscow. The perspective of conceptualism. It was in Bruce of Periulok, and then uh, it, uh, ha it had to go to uh, uh, Hawaii, Gunululu. And actually, I handed over that uh, recording to the archive. So they were legendary times. I guess uh, you had more palms there rather than pieces of art uh, on that uh, uh, video recording. Yes, Gunululu. Says for itself. You actually trust the life of this art movement to institutions, uh, completing your mission to capture that art process, or 
would you like to capture something? Maybe the secret passion is still inside you because you are about to publish the 13th or 14th volume. Well, you know, we um, were not mm, meant to be archivists. It just happened uh, by chance. For example, speaking about Talochkin, he was a real um, archivist. It's just uh, mm, we found ourselves in this situation by chance. And because we knew that nobody else could do it. It's a pity that Vadim Zaharov is not here with us because he uh, mentioned that he had this passion for archiving. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it waned away. Yes, he mentioned that uh, he was um, no longer interested in that recently. So he changed the focus of his attention from the past uh, uh, to the present, uh, to the future, actually, to the future uh, prospect. Yes, and he is more focused on his uh, art. And uh, he is uh, interested in different things that happen outside. So speaking about this desire to capture the art process when no one else uh, does it, it uh, was not uh, uh, something that the younger generation uh, inherited. They either rely on the institutions that have to uh, capture different process within the art circle, or they could uh, just delegate this function to media. Because uh, uh, the inspection of uh, medical hermeneutic group uh, archive was very difficult to collect. Uh, some installations, some photos, some texts uh, were being collected, but uh, uh, it's not feasible to uh, collect everything because the artists themselves never kept anything. It's just a different generation when they became active, uh, um, the first institutions appeared that did it professionally. When we started doing it, um, no uh, such institutions existed. Uh, and uh, as to this hermeneutics group, uh, they could rely on the first institutions that appeared uh, during that time. We're speaking about late 80s, right? Yes. But what kind of institutions? We're not going to discuss this, right? You can't imagine that desert uh, uh, that we found ourselves in. I mean, info informational desert, because there were no publications, no mass media, uh, no TV uh, programs. Whenever some photo uh, was published uh, in uh, the magazine or newspaper abroad, it was a big event, whereas now uh, it's um, been done on a mass scale. There's a paradox here. 
uh, products related to the openness of uh, uh, information. And that's what we um, saw when we worked on self-organization initiatives during the last 15 years. Uh, you know, this uh, access to online information, to social networks, uh, and uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, control your heritage led to the fact that nothing is kept. So our archivists uh, uh, play the role of psychotherapists that make young artists uh, um, remember what happened uh, 10 or 15 years ago. So this uh, therapeutic function of archive that we continue to uh, perform um, uh, was uh, uh, something you had because you always uh, uh, made uh, yourself remember what happened uh, the previous day in order to uh, enter tomorrow with clear vision and clear consciousness. Do you think that this quality has had been lost? You mean uh, new, the new generation? Yes. Well, uh, there are more and more new institutions that appear. And then uh, the institution, the internet uh, uh, makes um, all this universal, all this information universal. But it's also a question of self-reflection. The Moscow archive of new art was a reflexive instrument. Uh, yes, maybe we were the generation um, uh, and we were more reflexive generation because this was a form of life for us, a form of being for us to reflect upon things. I remember there was Vladimir Lefet who um, came up with the theory of reflective games or reflective play. So uh, this was um, very important. Um, uh, back in the 80s. So this was a very popular theory at that time. But on the other hand, the archive is a machine uh, n not the uh, depository of the past, but more uh, like more like a tool for um, creating uh, uh, the and the uh, contemporary. So this contemporary art situation does not capture itself for, uh, in the format of family album. For example, what Georgi was doing during many, many years and what Igor was doing when they were filming uh, their inner circles during leisure time or during art making. We do not see such albums today, even though uh, everybody has some uh, device that uh, um, can uh, um, let you take uh, thousands of photos. And uh, a young artist uh, finds it difficult to list uh, the last five exhibitions that he participated in. So uh, this uh, is this a pathology uh, related to generation, or is this a regular feature? I think uh, just album is not a relevant form of archiving, because there are self uh, uh, reproductive models on the internet, or maybe some institutions that uh, do this. Uh, the artist himself no longer wants to do it. Yeah, I, I guess I agree. For example, Facebook is um, a modern uh, archive, and everybody is trying to fill uh, it in. As to hermeneutics group, I guess the reason was that there was uh, not a single um, photographer among them. Yeah, so they were not lucky unlike collective actions group. I think that social networks as a form of archive uh, doesn't work well. Uh, it's not working well, do you agree? Uh, it feels like a jellyfish. 
and it makes a certain impact on the art process itself. But if we um, talk about the efforts of uh, art institutions, I wanted to remind you uh, of a book published by the Institute of Contemporary Art, published in 1996. It's, uh, it was called The Archive of Russian Contemporary Art, when the students that uh, studied uh, at the Art Institute um, uh, were, taking, were taking interviews uh, um, with artists of the older generation. Yes, we are now discussing this uh, with the students uh, um, that study at the moment so that we could continue uh, that um, line of interviews and uh, perhaps uh, have a pub publication. Well, I'm all for it, as always, because uh, I'm interested uh, in these technologies of self-capturing uh, um, th that all the artists and art historians should have. And uh, I wish somebody um, gave a course uh, on archiving at the um, Institute of um, Contemporary Arts, because it would be extremely useful for young artists. Another interesting thing related to Moscow School of Conceptualism is something that cannot be reproduced in other movements and in other generations. It is uh, Moscow Conceptualism is taken as a family, as a close circle of friends. So those relationships uh, or friendship uh, is this uh, some uh, um, uh, key feature of the school? This was a specific uh, characteristic of that generation. Uh, we were very few. Uh, you know, it was a form of self-organization. And so we had to coordinate uh, all the plans, projects, arts initiatives. Uh, so this was something that brought us together. And Georgi uh, and Igor remember this very well. So of course, uh, these are things that are connected to each other. So. Uh, I think that uh, that school uh, died, and what happened in the 1990s, um, whether they belong to the Moscow uh, School of Conceptualism or not. These uh, were different kind of trees, different branches. I'd say it uh, finished in 1987-1988, but the artists continued uh, uh, to live and to work. They meet in London or Los Angeles or Warsaw. It's not an internal self-organization that used to exist previously. It was more about uh, um, coordinating uh, things uh, with external partners and institutions. So this experience cannot be reproduced, as far as I understand, just due to historical environment. Uh, this uh, experience of friendship as a format of uh, 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 production uh, something that uh, became, uh, uh, you know, um, that Victor Mediana calls uh, Tusovka, just, uh, you know, mixing, mixing up and chatting with each other. The infrastructure changed and uh, a chance to make money uh, appeared. So you know, people began to use this chance to make money because in the 70s uh, and um, uh, 80s uh, we didn't have such chance. 
there were some uh, discussions with young artists uh, related to professionalism. What is professionalism? I think that professionalism is art. is not necessarily does not necessarily depend on making some uh, uh, profit uh, from your art. So when uh, you were doing art uh, uh, when uh, it never brought you any money, were you uh, professionals at that time or not? I'm very careful about the word professional. For me, a professional is a person who somehow lost freshness of art and he sort of sticks to some uh, skills that uh, he developed and uh, it uh, uh, makes him, uh, it uh, creates certain restrictions for him. So I think that uh, art is driven by amateurs. So it's very difficult for me to say whether we were professionals. So the specifics of this phenomenon, which is called uh, the Moscow School of Conceptualism, is uh, not a phenomenon der derivative from some uh, deeper processes. So it just happened like this, like Kade has uh, uh, been existing for 40 years and um, many groups, uh, uh, you know, fell apart like uh, medical hermeneutics, uh, the group uh, Champions of the World uh, um, fell apart as well, or uh, Muhomori, they also fell apart. So, uh, some people got together, so they, some of, and they continue to exist up to no, now, even though everybody uh, is pursuing their own way. Uh, there's uh, a very high degree of tolerance, and maybe this uh, mm, keeps them together because they don't argue, and we prefer to uh, create uh, and to, hold, to keep this myth. Even though everybody is uh, pursuing their own path, uh, but you're moving in the same direction, right? More or less. And this is what uh, uh, indicated in some of uh, uh, art historian papers. So the archive was uh, a creative instrument. It was a very important feature of Moscow School of Conceptualism and its participants. And uh, the uh, life of this school uh, continues, but the uh, instrument, instrument uh, uh, is left behind. Self-archiving was the only form um, of uh, confirming our um, existence. Of course, uh, th there are different forms of archiving at the moment, so you can uh, share the responsibility for archiving with other institutions, with other people. It's interesting that um, you uh, mentioned the word self-organization uh, with regard to the arts uh, in the 70s and 80s and with regard to uh, Moscow conceptualism. So I would love to ask you 
for advice to Moscow artists, for, to young artists that are not part uh, of a um, bigger art system. And sometimes uh, they feel despair about their status, about their way in art. What kind of instruments should they use in order to become noticeable, in order to uh, become part of history? Well, it's a different uh, situation now. I don't think we should speak about non-conformism. Uh, there's no censorship, I said with a, very carefully. Well, um, there is a new wording, self-censorship. So there are many opportunities. You should just use them professionally. But uh, uh, what is professionalism today? That's an open question. We have to discuss it separately, probably. Well, this way or other, every artist has his or her own way, whether it started in the 70s or in the 90, in the year 1990 or later. I would recommend them to uh, keep their own archives, uh, to collect all the materials about the exhibitions and publications. Uh, I, I guess it would be good to, to advise as to how to become um, famous, but I guess uh, there is no recipe for that. Maybe I would sound uh, old-fashioned, but uh, uh, all I can uh, say is that uh, you should uh, be brave and hardworking. It's a very um, difficult uh, task. And it's not uh, often, uh, it's very rarely that uh, an artist uh, becomes famous. Uh, for example, if you uh, make some uh, big steps when you're young, uh, gradually uh, you uh, become uh, uh, more slow and then you find yourself in a sort of the forest and it's very difficult uh, uh, to get, uh, to break through it. So that's why um, I uh, uh, mentioned uh, being uh, uh, courageous. Uh, so it's um, very important uh, uh, to have this courage. Like uh, Kabakov used to say, it's always uh, a, a long run. So you can't uh, do a sprint there. And my uh, last question is related to your position concerning archive and archiving as a process. I had uh, to encounter two uh, polarized uh, um, points of view. Um, so one of them says that uh, 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 if you make your way to the archive, it means that you uh, will uh, be part of the history. And the other point of view is a very hostile attitude because uh, whenever the artist is in the archive, it's like a grave for the artist. So what can you say about uh, your own attitude and which one uh, feels right. Is this the end of life uh, uh, or is uh, this uh, uh, a continuation of life? I think the first one uh, is uh, closer to me. Uh, well, uh, it's true that the attitude to archive um, was very varied. And, you know, uh, one of the uh, uh, poets used to say, uh, don't uh, uh, tremble over your manuscripts, uh, don't start an archive. This is one of the points of view, uh, but it's not very popular. Uh, manuscripts uh, uh, can never be burned. Uh, 
uh, you know, this, expre this expression. I think you have uh, um, to be very attentive and careful about archives. Uh, and I think that um, uh, it's, um, this is my attitude. I think uh, it's very important to uh, capture the art process. Uh, I think that uh, these points of view are about uh, um, uh, are a little bit exaggerated. For example, let's uh, uh, take a designer. Uh, the designer is collecting his portfolio, shows it to different companies, and then gets some uh, commissions. You don't have to use uh, uh, the word archive. You just collect information about your works, and there's nothing strange about it. It's a very natural process. So now we get back to the um, problem of professionalism and uh, taking art as work, because not everybody shares this view on art as work. And that's why we have these uh, polarized views um, with regard to archive and archivist's work. I guess we haven't really considered all the aspects but I hope that it's not going to be our last meeting. And I would like to thank everybody who came here to talk about archive uh, and conceptualism um, that has been archived. And I would like to thank all the donators, uh, all the donors that help uh, the Garage Museum grow. Um, its archive uh, and make sure that all these historical documents are available uh, for the public. And I would like to thank uh, um, uh, all the people in the audience uh, for coming. Uh, can I ask you the first question? Uh, and my question is to you, Sasha. You said that uh, some artifacts that you receive, uh, uh, you are sometimes not sure whether it's a piece of art or, or just a, a unit uh, of archive. But I guess uh, uh, this is start with Marcel Duchamp. Uh, uh, you know, whenever a piece uh, uh, appeared in the museum, it was a nomination uh, for a piece of art. So uh, maybe it's uh, the fact that something um, uh, was brought to you uh, becomes uh, turns it uh, into a unit of archive and so it, it uh, becomes a part of history because you are collecting uh, the uh, history so do you have uh, some hierarchy of uh, values why do you take uh, um, uh, donations from Kise Walter Bakstein and Makarevich you probably have some criteria for selection well, on the one hand, uh, yes, there are certain criteria. Like I won't uh, uh, take uh, uh, the collection of paintings or uh, some series of graphic uh, uh, works, which is trying to be as arty as possible. As to the boundary or borderline options that combine the status of document and the status of a piece of art, uh, all those uh, borderline items can become uh, a part of the archive and stand a chance. For example, the collection uh, granted to us by Viktor Pivovarov, his exhibition is currently on display here uh, at Garage. He uh, gave us the sketches of his books, uh, even the books that haven't yet been published. And we can see how he uh, uh, lays out and marks out the compositions uh, on the pages uh, while using a pencil. And then uh, um, some, uh, uh, we, we see how illustrations appear. So is this just a draft or uh, a piece of art of graphic uh, work by Viktor Pivovarov? I prefer to think that um, they're both. 
And the same is true uh, about uh, Andrei Monastirsky's poems uh, that were given uh, by Igor Makarevich. It's true that uh, there are some uh, manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts, uh, uh, and uh, also some uh, uh, typewritten uh, uh, writings. Uh, no illustrations, nothing. Uh, his poems uh, published in the 1970s, but uh, there is a unique uh, uh, leaf, a unique page that is part of his uh, elementary uh, um, uh, poem when uh, the um, uh, layout is as important as the content of that poem. So it's uh, uh, just like with Pivovarov's uh, uh, work, it's a borderline element in our archive because it's uh, an, it can be it can be an exhibit of the uh, graphics uh, of the 70s and also a, a poem um, uh, a, a document and so we are using this especially that uh, many things uh, uh, flow into our exhibition activities but also uh, remain uh, in the research area. I think it's a piece of art and not uh, um, some archive material, because you are uh, functioning as a museum and not as an archive. I can retort uh, and say that any archive collection, if we take uh, a state archive, a Russian state archive, or the archive of literature and art, uh, or uh, some others with uh, some private uh, collections, it can be engineer, uh, engineers or surgeons, um, all those archives have uh, the documents that not just illustrate the biography of the uh, archives creator or archives owner, but also some um, transitory um, elements like bridges uh, um, to uh, go to a different uh, um, thing, like museum uh, kind of thing. Uh, and some uh, and there is some exam there, there are some examples of graphics and uh, the album uh, with Pushkin's drawings um, uh, is also kept in the archive and not in the Tretyakov of gallery can I uh, um, ask you a question Thank you for this uh, round table. And do you think uh, um, there could uh, be an archive open for everyone? And would it, uh, could it uh, do some harm to the interpretation of the archive? Or um, uh, do archives exist only for art historians, for uh, researchers? I guess uh, not a single archive can remain open for all. Well, we try to be as open as possible. Uh, most of the documents that we uh, keep uh, will be accessible to any user, uh, including the users that users that can't come to Moscow and see it. And that's why uh, we digitize uh, all the materials. But there are uh, some f uh, elements, some items that uh, may not be published uh, uh, within a certain period of time. For example, the personal uh, correspondence between a collector and an artist or between uh, two artists. And this is something that we uh, cannot publish uh, during quite a long time. So I can't, I can't say that uh, it's under the censorship, but uh, this is uh, the material that has to withstand uh, time in order to become available. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this round table. It was very interesting for me 
uh, to listen to your round table discussion. You were speaking about uh, photographs and poems, but uh, if we speak about uh, Moscow conceptualism, there were lots of different actions and performances and many kinds of innovative um, uh, art. So, how uh, could you keep some of the mater materials uh, and uh, uh, could have a recording of those uh, um, kind of performances that are difficult uh, to capture? Well, it's true about Dadaists and conceptualists. For, uh, conceptualists uh, had a video camera and Dada artists didn't have it. Uh, well, uh, there are some manuscripts, tickets, uh, uh, invitations, uh, photographs, uh, usually they are black and white photographs, not very clear ones, some memories of those people that participated, their video recordings and some other stuff. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, some labels with a sign uh, uh, Homo sapiens uh, that uh, Rima Girlovina used uh, during her zoo uh, uh, action in 1977. So uh, what, we, uh, what kind of records uh, do we have from that action, uh, action? Only that little label and photos. Well, there are some video recordings of later actions. If uh, it were possible, uh, we would have a time machine in the archive that would take you um, uh, back to the 13th of March 1976 to see the first uh, action of the collective actions group. I would use it myself happily. Well, if there are no other questions, I would like to thank you all for coming. And please uh, come back again. Um, come and visit us uh, in the archive. Beginning with September, we are going to have a different uh, uh, space to work. It will be more spacious. And then we are going to launch our online catalog soon. So thank you once again.